Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this lecture today. Uh, as we begin our uh, program today, I would like to um, start by acknowledging that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of Ashinabe, Cree, which Cree Dakota, and then the peoples, and on the homelands of Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. It is our, it is my excitement today to uh, introduce our guest speaker, Omar Gandhi. Uh, he's a principal of Omar Gandhi Architects with a team in Halifax and Toronto. He studied uh, architecture at the University of Toronto and Dalhousie. And he began his professional experience with um, KPMB. Omar founded his architecture practice in 2010. And since then, his work has been recognized widely and internationally. Some of his recognitions include professional pre drome by Canadian Art, uh, Council of Arts, Architecture League New York Emerging Voices recognition in 2016, 2018 Governor General Medal in Architecture. He was, his work has been uh, widely published, including Wallpaper, Monocle, Architectural Record Magazine. And uh, in 2018, he was appointed as the Louis Kahn Visiting Professorship at Yale School of Architecture. Most recently, 2020, his studio won the competition to design the new Art Gallery of Nova Scotia together with KPMB. And his work on Peggy's Cove was completed last year, 2021. In my view, as most of us know his work, his work comes across as contribution to the local narratives as they intervene into weave with vernacular landscape and environments. Much of beautiful work to be seen today. I hope uh, we all enjoy. And with that, please join me in welcoming, warm welcoming um, Omar to this virtual podium, Omar. Thank you very much. Uh, really happy to be uh, speaking to the class, to the school. Um, I know we, we were just talking uh, earlier, just saying, you know, we tried to do this a little bit earlier. So it's kind of nice that uh, we, can, we can finally do it. And hopefully soon we'll be able to do stuff like this in person. Um, last time I was in Winnipeg uh, was actually for an awards event a few years ago and just remembered, uh, I remember, I recall just thinking what an incredible place um, with, you know, it, it was clearly kind of on the cusp of really sort of exploding in terms of the food and uh, restaurant scene. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we had a, a beautiful little tour with 546 and went to a couple of their projects and you know I think uh, much like Halifax I think that some of the best work uh, in the country I think is is coming from uh, those underdog places I think that aren't necessarily focused on as much and and I you know I'm totally rooting for everything that's happening over there um, so I will just carry on and I think I have so just a bit of an introduction, and, and I'll say that every time I start planning a, a new lecture, um, I try and like trim out some of the front part. Uh, it's like 12 years into my practice now, but it always, I sit down in front of the computer on PowerPoint and I start looking at kind of the first, you know, few years and thinking, you know, it's been so long now and I've shown this for such a long time. It's, you know, clearly not as important anymore. Um, but it is very difficult for me to delete it because it was the foundation for kind of everything that followed. It's almost like, uh, you know, the work afterwards, um, you know, although it might get a bit more visibility and things, um, it was those first years and trying to figure out what my own voice was, uh, you know, um, that was really kind of the beautiful part. So I'll start here. Uh, I'm, I'm from Ontario. I grew up in Brampton. I uh, went to the University of Toronto for three years uh, in the BA program in architectural studies uh, and was desperately looking for a master's program um, to kind of 
get a professional degree. And so knowing that most of my peers were going to be applying to U of T uh, for the master's program, uh, I decided to bail a year, a year early before kind of this huge sort of flood of people um, ended up applying it, because I was in the first year of the BA program. It was like all of a sudden there was going to be like 400 people applying to master's programs across the country. Uh, and so in my first kind of like attempt at strategy, I pulled the plug on the program a year early um, and started really kind of investigating schools across the country. And although I didn't know much about Halifax, I knew that many of my teachers went to school at tons uh, and, you know, really recommended the place. And so I ended up going kind of sight unseen almost. Uh, and it was everything and more that I could have imagined. It was a place where we learned how to make things with our hands. And I think that was really even at that point, you know, um, 20 years ago, uh, it was something that differentiated itself from other schools. Uh, they had a free lab program where we really got to go out and you know, even if you were someone like me with an arts background and never really had any experience in construction, it was a place where we got to feel those materials and hold a hammer and stand on a property. Uh, this being on the Citadel in the middle of the city, city where we had to put up this structure uh, in the middle of the night um, and then take it down before kind of the authorities came to see it uh, in the morning. And for me, it was, on top of the building side, it was kind of my first, you know, attempt at photography as well. Uh, you know, shooting something in the middle of the night when there's no light at all ended up being a pretty difficult thing, but sort of, uh, you know, uh, a first for a lot of things, including, you know, getting into Canadian architect, right? There's sort of like a first of many different things uh, that you're checking off the box as, as we're going. So this was in 2003. So I moved back to Halifax uh, after leaving after school uh, in 2008. I worked for Brian McKay Lyons for about a year and a half. And um, I could say that, you know, having my own practice wasn't something I even had uh, in my mind at all. It wasn't part of the plan, at least not for kind of the foreseeable future. Um, but it just so happened, like happens in all offices, you know, people come and go and I ended up kind of getting laid off at that point uh, and found myself, you know, having moved to a city and not having a job and <laughs> no disrespect to the other firms, I uh, wasn't going to apply to any of the other ones. So, you know, it was sort of a moment in time where I was like this, you know, before I had a project of my own, uh, it was sort of like, well, what if I did have a practice and what would I do if I did have one? You know, you start thinking about places you've worked and start thinking about places you'd learned about and think, well, this would be my dream practice. This is how I'd want to treat people. And this is the kind of way that, you know, pro projects and processes would unfold. And so there was all this sort of like pretending and imagining before anything really happened. But fortunately for me, because, you know, pretending and, and role playing doesn't exactly pay the mortgage uh, or the rent, uh, within the first couple of weeks, um, a small project for some friends of ours in Liverpool, Nova Scotia popped up. And it was like, when I mean popped up, it's like I, did, I wouldn't even have known how to go after a project. Uh, it was just a conversation that started. And, you know, they basically came to me and said, you know, we, and this is sort of where Liverpool is, just about an hour south of Halifax. Um, we want to take this century old home that we've had for a couple of years. Uh, they're the town docks in a small town and, you know, Liverpool is the kind of place that you see across Canada, uh, across the US, you know, with an aging population and an economy that's sort of fading away, industry slowing down, uh, a place where, you know, kids play on the front lawn. Uh, and so these were the town docks that really had an important role uh, in this little town. And they wanted to extend on the back of their house uh, to accommodate for their growing family. And so, you know, that's not a project I would take on anymore, but I saw that only as an opportunity uh, 
to experiment with a few things. One, of course, learn about construction and the process and working with a client, but also an idea about, you know, the juxtaposition of both traditional and contemporary work, um, how to be respectful of context uh, and the local vernacular, um, and also the idea of modesty. Um, as you can imagine, in a place like that, the last thing you really want to kind of evoke is a sense of wealth or entitlement or any of that sort of thing. And so how can you add on to a house in a place where all eyes are probably on it all the time? They know that the town docks live there and, you know, people are struggling to make ends meet. Right. And, um, you know, so I think there was a really an idea about being extremely kind of low key and camouflaged. And so, you know, sitting at my desk, asking myself, well, you know, I worked for Bruce Kobara and Brian McKay Lyons and, you know, Rod Robbie and all these people, you know, knowing how their processes worked, you know, what was my voice? How was I going to approach a project? And so I fortunately had sort of clear enough mind to not kind of refer to anything, but just uh, respond to information. Where's the sun rising? Where's the sun setting? Where's the untapped view? Um, where's the street and how are the eyes of the street going to be looking at the building? Um, this was a building um, and that was the current massing on the left side that had a little addition on the back side of it from, I'd say, like the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, you know, how would maximum area look? And then what if I articulated it in a very gentle way that really it's kind of working to help in terms of solar shading? So, you know, as few, almost as if you could kind of like break it down into one, two or three moves, how would that work? And so very quickly it turned into card models and wood models and starting to identify what that form would be, um, not thinking about kind of glamour shots or anything, but thinking about program and how it would work in the most subtle way. And so the project's called Cedar and Three Textures because we reclad the entire century old home uh, in an Eastern white cedar that you see everywhere. So sort of like a new jacket. Uh, and then as a way of articulating kind of the massing of the, the new part on the back, it was about these varying board widths uh, of Eastern white cedar. And so you can see here, uh, and this was back in 2010, I think, 2011. Um, and, you know, it's a funny thing to say, I couldn't have been more proud of this project and the process, you know, it's sort of you imagine these things coming together and although, you know, it's a pretty simple idea, you know, there's always as an architect, a million things that can go wrong, uh, and a million voices that get in the way of your simple idea. Uh, I, I always joke with my team, uh, Jeff Shaw in particular, who's been with me since the beginning, that construction and the CA process is sort of like just trying to get into the end zone. Everybody is doing everything they can uh, to swat the ball out of your hand. And all you need to do is like go one yard further to get it in. And like, you know, you're hanging on to it. So this felt like a victory from that side. Um, just a couple images of that back. So it's clear kind of like uh, dichotomy in terms of the front and back of the house. Uh, and so the, I'd say the most important part of that first project, of course, you know, to kind of get your feet wet, it was the builder. Uh, we interviewed three people, two were, you know, highly respected men um, in the area who, you know, had been kind of the name that everyone was bouncing around. And then the third uh, was a red seal carpenter um, who just blew our minds in terms of knowledge uh, and I would say kind of confidence that she worked for. And so Deborah Herman, Herman Spartanelli become, became the builder of this project, but also a huge mentor in my own life. Uh, in that time, you know, this was only project two or one, um, not really having a whole lot of confidence in terms of the process and construction and that. And so to really be able to kind of lean on someone uh, was a huge asset for me and really sort of be on site and have kind of the courage to say that you don't understand something and you need to see it. And so this project actually came from Deborah. She came to me and said, you know, Omar, these new clients uh, came to me. They want to renovate their little cottage. 
uh, just about 10 minutes away from that first project. And I said, I was working with you and they want to meet you. And so I met with them and we looked at this, you know, cottage that was probably built in the fifties or sixties, you know, not special, but the property was really special. Um, and so we walked around the property and they talked about their grandkids playing in kind of the landscape. And there's this really kind of grassy bowl area that everyone gravitated towards and they would have picnics there. And so I went away for a week and I came back and I met with them and they said, well, what are your thoughts? What do you think we should do uh, for the renovation? And in that moment of realizing that it was my second project, you know, the first one wasn't actually done at this point, um, taking a deep breath and saying, um, I think you should demolish your cottage. Uh, and we should build something new and, and kind of taking that deep breath and knowing full well that uh, that might be the end of the journey for Omar Gandhi architect before it really gets started. Um, I said, you know, you talked about this, this part of the landscape and about the grandkids. And so what if like grandmother's arms, you wrapped your hands uh, or if the building wrapped its arms kind of around this landscape feature so that you could always look in on it, uh, it becomes kind of the central figure. And what if, you know, as we're looking at this massing that's really starts with, you know, the most kind of utilitarian kind of shed form uh, where it becomes contorted and we play with the roof of it and on one side is very much private uh, on the master bedroom side and the middle is kind of the social sphere and then the guests sort of come and go on the the other side where a is and then really starting to experiment in my you know it was just me at that point in my attic starting to play with card models you know the kind of models that aren't really meant to be shown to anybody it's about real process and investigation it doesn't matter you know i've always i've always said that you know there's a big difference between kind of monograph sketches which i don't do and the kind of sketches that are meant uh to explore and investigate the honest stuff and i think that's where the gold is right and it just so happened that this model got kept but you know a lot of things ended up on the floor as they should and then really starting to get into it starting to think about structure and form and you know actual kind of details like the slope of the roof looking at the Brie Soleil and how you cut down on kind of that summer sun and how you might allow light in from the roof peeling back kind of part of the roof where it starts to jumble next to kind of the central roof almost like clipping a bird's wings a little bit and really kind of starting to get into it. It's like, okay, wow, people are actually going with what I'm saying. So let's just like keep this rolling here and let's start thinking about compression and like narrative and, you know, procession, you know, the idea of driving to this property where you actually don't see the ocean for a long time because it's tree lined. Uh, and then when you finally get here, you know, maybe like Frank Lloyd Wright, where you can kind of push down and almost create this crescendo moment where when you turn the corner, you know, together with light and acoustics and everything, it was really meant to kind of um, be a special moment every time you turn that corner. And then seeing those crazy ideas that you can't believe people are agreeing with turn into construction, which costs a lot of money, is both like the most exciting thing in the world and also uh, painfully uh, terrifying um, because you haven't done anything for anyone to actually trust you yet. And for some reason they are. Um, and, you know, just fast forward to now, which is like 12 years later, it's like people are still listening to this stuff. Um, but to just stand on site and see that those card models actually become built form, you know, people, men and women putting these pieces together um, is, you know, I don't think as an architect, you should ever uh, get over that feeling because that's really kind of the gold of it all right? Like people are building ideas that we all talked about. And then seeing ideas about texture and light and darkness and compression, materiality, how these things come together, you know, kind of pouring everything into it. It's a lot easier when there was only one project on the table and you could just pour yourself into it. It felt like every project you were working on 
um, was the most important you ever did because honestly, I was trying to put myself kind of on the map, you know, like trying to prove that I deserve to be there. And so this thing starts coming together. And on the one side, you have the private side, uh, very much at kind of the human scale and at the scale of the cottages that surround uh, the area. But then on, of course, back to this slide, you know, it opens up towards that ocean view and you start to see kind of opportunities for opening and closing uh, indoor, outdoor, and really trying to kind of take advantage in a way that they hadn't really considered where these special moments might occur. Of course, all wrapped around that central grassy bowl that we talked about. And that's me looking like a goof on the right, obviously. And that's Deborah next to me. Uh, and then the two clients. And, you know, I look back at this image all the time um, because like I was saying, like there, <laughs> there was no reason to trust anything I said. Uh, but people, for some reason, believed in in me. Uh, so, you know, you never forget where you came from and the people who helped you get here. Um, so the third project, and so these three, which, you know, were all Omar in the attic for the most part, uh, all sort of happened at one time. Um, this was a project also sort of connected to the other one in that there was an article in the Globe and Mail about Deborah and I and the projects we were working on. And so these clients, which were slightly closer to Halifax than these other two, uh, were for people who had an empty nest, you know, their kids had grown up and moved out of the house. Uh, and it was really a project in the woods where they wanted to jump back onto those kind of dreams that they had when they were in university of being an artist. And so this was a place to make things and just kind of craft in a way that they kind of dreamt as younger people. And so in this situation, again, it was about those, those really kind of like uh, important but soft touch moves where we started with a vernacular form, you know, the 1212 gable and, you know, situated in this wooded landscape, it was about kind of raising up the one side and dropping down part of the roof to allow light into the studio. You know, the process is sort of like one move at a time until you've kind of solved the riddle of context and client and those kind of requirements uh, without doing any more than that. And that kind of remain the process afterwards and so you know sketching these ideas like how few moves could we make or could I make um, that took away from kind of that vernacular idea and so again these drawings and, and starting to model it and play with light and see how that's going to be impacted on the inside now the case in this project uh, unlike the first two with Deborah who was you know a very seasoned builder and 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 highly respected. This was a bunch of knuckleheads that came to my door. Uh, they were all like in their early 20s. And, you know, they were like, Omar, uh, I really want to work with you on this. And, you know, Mike, who came to the door was like, you know, five foot one or something and covered in tattoos and was like, want to work on this project. We just started our own little gig. We want to work on this. And so it ended up becoming like the most insane labor of love for not only me, but for them as well. Like, it's amazing what you can do when everybody is trying to prove their value. And so with a super small budget, um, you know, for regular people, like, you know, before they bought this property and wanted to build this house, they were living in a basement apartment in the north end of Halifax. And so this was a huge dream for them, but we're still not really in the realm of like custom contemporary architecture, but that didn't matter. We were going to make it that. And so it was about shop grade plywood and lights that we made by kind of Jimmy rigging things uh, and finding screens that we found in the bottom of like the dumpster pile. So really trying to do it the most we could um, for as little as possible. And I think also only possible because I'm not keeping track of my time and neither are the builders. You know, we're all going in to this thing uh, knowing that this was going to shape our careers. And so seeing those kind of original ideas, you know, that single push down on the roof and the way it rises up at the back and the long slit along the front, um, 
seeing that through again. So once again, getting to the end zone without letting people swat the ball out of your hand. And so even like light coves in those ceilings and those lights hanging down, I mean, those are not like, you know, fancy ones that you get from, you know, whatever lighting manufacturer, like that was just going to Canadian Tire and putting a couple things together and may or may not have passed uh, code there, but uh, they didn't notice. And so again, you know, these pictures that I look back so fondly on now, um, a team of builders that had clearly like killed themselves to build this thing, uh, all with cameras um, so that they could show their partners and their parents um, what they'd been working on for the last eight months. You know, it was a really, really special moment. And so at that point, you know, I had a practice, you know, it was still just me, but now was time to start thinking just slightly bigger than that. And if those few first projects started to get a little bit of attention and it was really time now, you know, after having kind of followed my gut to think about this process. And so I came up with this term adaptation and that was really kind of the process then. And it's the process now. Our projects begin with a simple local precedent, often a hip roof or gable form. The form is then extruded up or across, bent or flattened. The roof planes folded and pleated. Sculpted by conditions in use, the reconstituted adaptation is receptive and responsive in its keeping with a modest formal lineage. That's the recipe. And you kind of, that, that recipe goes anywhere. It goes with me to Toronto, it goes to the Okanagan, it goes to the States. It doesn't really matter. It's the same story about people and places. And so in those first few years, starting to then use that formula or that process in a series of projects that started popping up. So in 2012, Jeff finally joins me. Um, and, you know, we've been together really since, and this was the first office, a pretty small room, but man, did it feel special uh, being in there. And then over the course of those next few years, really dotting the landscape in Nova Scotia with projects, Black Gables, two kind of skewed Black Gabled forms. One was the main home and the other was the artist studio, Harbor Heights. Uh, in 2014, uh, moved down the hall, same building, which was in the immigration annex of Pier 21, a real kind of historical uh, gem in the city that uh, really was kind of the gateway for people coming into Canada uh, by boat uh, through most of the last century came through this building. And so it was a pretty special place um, to have our studio. And so people, you know, we started kind of growing the team one by one. And I can tell you, even now, we only have, between the two offices, we have like 13 or 14 people, and it's literally been the most incremental growth um, you could imagine, and it's just because uh, I find hiring people and, you know, having staff to be a terrifying thing, you know, it's a huge responsibility to be an employer and to look after people's families and to make sure that we have enough work in the pipeline. And uh, I've had to lay off people, I think maybe once or twice in the last 12 years. Uh, and it's something that sticks with you if you really care uh, about your people. And so, you know, instead of having one project in the pipeline to hire someone, it's like, in my mind, I need three or four to know that these people are safe. So again, this is kind of in the middle of the last 12 years, uh, other projects in the region that we worked on and really kind of, you can see clearly there's a huge uh, gap now between, you know, the, the construction cost of those first projects to, you know, projects like this, where there's, you know, a higher level of detail and, you know, really starting to play with different kinds of uh, program as well. That's sort of outside the norm. Um, there were no cantilevers in the first three projects. <laughs> and so in 2016, uh, partially because um, we were starting to get a bit more attention across the country and I wanted to really kind of tap into the Toronto market, 
uh, but mostly because I wanted to be closer to my family uh, and my friends. We opened uh, a studio in Parkdale in Toronto that we still have, um, led by Stephanie Hossein. Um, and it's a small studio. Uh, we have a landscape division that's now a part of that. Um, and so it's a pretty exciting thing. You know, before COVID, I was basically back and forth between the two studios every 10 days for about four or five years. And really still kind of looking at, um, you know, vernacular, looking at these things that we take for granted in the countryside and in cities like this gambrel form that we took as inspiration for this project, which is clearly, you know, of a different language, but draws from kind of those um, silhouettes that you see in the landscape. This is the lookout uh, in Inverness um, that really is kind of set up on this huge cliff uh, and really kind of cuts into the wind. It's almost not just uh, embracing the climate, it's, it's sort of cutting into it and fighting against it. And so this hood with a low kind of slung brim um, faces the water and cuts into the wind. So we'll go into a couple projects um, in a bit more depth. So Sluice Point, which is in the south tip of Nova Scotia uh, in Yarmouth County, uh, this was a project we competed for against another local architect uh, with a Swiss client who bought this property. And really, again, I, I think the first chapter of any project for us is, is really investigating, learning about the history of a place, uh, you know, and in this case, it was about the Acadian people and the lands that they inhabited. And so seeing kind of remnants of this here, which is kind of the, the structure that you see throughout um, in these kind of marshy landscapes where they held up this armature, this frame to dry hay for the fields uh, and really was a way of survival for the people because they were uh, by the British given kind of the lowest quality land when they re sort of inhabited the province. Uh, this was kind of the response. Um, and so uh, in kind of thinking about this project, it was it was really about kind of the extension landscape. And so, you know, almost kind of squinting your eyes and seeing this like little lump or bump in the landscape that really comes down to the ground on both sides. And so uh, at first this was a kind of a two form thing it ended up becoming one, but really kind of uh, was set out at the perimeter of this little peninsula in the marshlands. This was a drawing that one of my staff a student did. Um, sometimes I get way too invested in these things, but this was like a drawing that he spent like six weeks working on. Uh, it's probably like four by eight feet in size. Um, and he probably, yeah, like this, the, the sky alone with little cotton balls and uh, graphite shavings. You know, I, I think I was the biggest fan ever just like standing over his shoulder watching him draw this. Um, yeah, it's, it's a pretty exciting thing, the whole process. And so this is sort of looking down at the roof um, of this project that really is kind of about this hip form that gets contorted uh, and bent around um, basically right out to kind of the edge of the marshland itself. And again, you know, when we're working in these rural landscapes, um, you can imagine that contemporary architecture and some of the ways that we describe things in our own little worlds are things that, you know, you're going to get a lot of pushback on, but also that people don't necessarily embrace because they don't understand. And, you know, I think that's one of the special things about the work that we do is that we talk about it in terms that people do understand because that's kind of the, those are the ingredients in the recipe. When we're talking about hip roofs and white cedar shingles uh, and, you know, those sort of things, um, you know, the end result might to them look like a super weird thing that they don't understand uh, or like for that matter. Um, but, you know, the, the idea there is kind of composed of the same thing. I always sort of say that, um, I love thinking about our projects as being part of a family, but definitely the weird kid, you know, which every family has. 
aspects of this project that really kind of stretches around and gives you sort of more than 180 degree view uh, of the water. And I'd say going back to the title, Where the Wild Things Are, which really was sort of, um, it was the name of my studio when I taught at Yale. Uh, I actually had the opportunity to bring them all to Inverness and Cape Breton, uh, the whole studio, which was amazing because I don't think any of them had ever even been to Canada, never mind the East Coast. Uh, and so to think and talk about these buildings in the landscape as having kind of dual sort of personalities that come to life at night was a special thing. Rabbit Snare Gorge in Inverness um, with Design Base 8. Uh, Design Base 8 were basically uh, three recent graduates uh, from New York uh, who knew the client. They were obviously very young in their career and didn't know how to approach a project. Um, so they reached out to us uh, and we ended up collaborating on it. And, you know, really it was a lot of their enthusiasm um, and, you know, the little bit of experience we had at this point that really kind of made it a special process. And so this is what Inverness looks like. It's like God's country, crazy hot, high cliffs. This property, um, it was called Rabbit Snare Gorge. Uh, and that was, that was a name that one of the uh, owners, previous owners whose family had inhabited it for several hundred years. Uh, said that, you know, because the property kind of had all these features, it had a little waterfall, it has a valley, it's crazy cliff, it's very rocky. Uh, it wasn't a property that could be farmed at all. It was a place where kids played. And so their grandfather would teach them how to snare rabbits. And so this first project, which was set really far back from the edge of the landscape, it was meant to kind of look in multiple directions, like a look off. Um, and also kind of look down this valley out towards the water. And so again, the process was the same, taking these local precedents and starting to really play with it, stretching it up and pushing it down and cutting kind of the corner so that you have these, you know, wildly sort of varying um, experiences throughout the building. Oh, sorry. Uh, and trying to draw from kind of peculiar sort of qualities uh, or features that you find in different, different places across Canada. And one that really stood out here were these wind blocks uh, that you often see just kind of like stuck on a building, almost like an afterthought. And really it's there just so that, you know, the door doesn't slam open and closed. And so, you know, you can smoke a dart on, you know, the front porch without uh, getting wet, basically. And so when I approached the client about that, and I said, you know, what if we did one out of core 10 steel and made it 25 feet high, even though it's going to weigh like two and a half tons, he was more excited than I was for some reason. And again, sort of like the charmed, weird miracle that is my career, um, sometimes things sort of go your way and you got to just go with it. And so this project, uh, which I guess was the last time I was in Winnipeg was for the GG Awards, is one of our most simple projects and really kind of about looking out in different directions and having kind of this feature on the back that is like these scars down the back elevation. And the, and the main entry really marked by this really odd mannerist sort of doorway. And on the property, you know, there was always the idea that there were these other little creatures. And so we were able to build one other one. And again, this sort of was the reason that the Yale studio uh, was here working on this property. It was kind of prompted by this idea that it was a perfect place for these incredible little, little fun buildings. And so this one, it's long shed building, completely clad in wood. Um, also kind of inspired by both my son's love for Transformers and my love for Tom Kundig. Um, this drawbridge front and kind of these bifolding kind of side doors. Uh, you know, I guess different than Tom Kundig in that uh, 
these parts that we used were from kind of the general store and also probably could kill somebody because they, it was all quite dodgy. Um, but it looks great in these photos. So, you know, this was sort of rounding out the first decade. We're almost at like year 10 here. And I had a book um, that I had been working on um, with Arkeen in Mexico City, uh, a kind of really nice way to sort of round out the decade and get some ideas down. And, you know, I think also speak to um, people who were just like me uh, at the beginning, not really knowing where I was going um, and kind of finding things out on the way, trying to do the right thing. And, uh, you know, really kind of just trying to do something that wasn't pretentious, but was really kind of from the heart. Um, and so that was always the thing. Nice things for good people was one of those corny lines that I remember talking to my buddy Eric Stotts about before I had that first project, but after I was laid off uh, in that gray zone, where I was like, all I want to do is work on good things uh, for good people, you know, and I guess one of the the kind of odd things about architecture and the way that things work is it's pretty natural. I think it's the sort of the natural starting point to start doing custom residences, cut the single family homes. It's it's kind of the way in, you know, anybody can do it. You don't even need to be an architect to do most of those things, but it's sort of where you really start kind of building that confidence. And so, you know, from then it, you know, moved into retail, it moved into, you know, restaurants like this place in Toronto uh, on Broadview that was really about carving out this more than century old kind of commercial building uh, to allow as much light in as possible um, from the top. So a different way of thinking about restaurants and certainly a different way of thinking about interiors for uh, a building and project like this. Now, some of you might know Maddie Matheson. I was just in uh, Wyoming two weeks ago and Billy Tien and Todd Williams were talking about uh, you know, their project they were working on with Barack Obama. And I just thought, well, I'm working with Maddie Matheson uh, on a restaurant. We've been working on it for the last five years. And they didn't know who I was talking about, but I thought it was pretty funny. Um, which is finally opening next month. And it's been a restaurant project we've been working on for five years. So it's a pretty special one that uh, I can't really show any images of yet. This is not it. This was our first sort of step into public architecture. And, you know, the only way that these sort of things can actually happen in this country is collaboration. I'm a huge fan of collaboration. I was able to work with uh, my first employers, uh, previously Young and Wright, but they were bought out by IBI, and we ended up collaborating, um, going for this project in Lunenburg. It's a municipal building, and so the idea here was that it would feel familiar. It's sort of like, again, the weird kid in the family where people um, in the community, and it's a small town where people are clearly not looking for modern architecture, um, and so there are certain things that resonate with them, like the hip roofs and the tones of uh, materials that were chosen, but then also kind of really sort of pushing uh, contemporary ideas like an all wood framed building and um, exceeding kind of accessibility standards uh, that were set out for 2030, we did on this project. It meets Rick Hansen standards. And so trying to kind of do, um, you know, think about architecture in a new way in places that, um, you know, aren't necessarily looking for that, but it's added value. And so seeing this sort of come together again, metal roofs and brick and wood, you know, very similar sort of palette to what we really like and are used to and seeing this thing come together. It was uh, an incredible experience for us. I think in my mind also, even though this is set in Lunenburg, part of me wanted to design a building that I knew that I saw in Brampton growing up in the suburbs, you know, like it speaks to a period of time somewhere in kind of the 50s and 60s where these kind of suburbs and towns were kind of 
founded and built. Uh, and there was a familiarity to it, even though we were kind of pushing ideas a little bit further. Ideas about light and you know these soft forms and accessibility. Um, I'm just I'm trying to speed up a little bit here. Um, Peggy's Cove. Okay, well, let me start by saying that this was the most terrifying project that any of us had worked on because we were dealing with something that uh, is, you know, obviously one of Canada's sort of prized uh, national, national historic sites. It's huge pride in Nova Scotia with it, and it's a major tourist attraction, the, you know, the biggest tourist attraction. And so when we kind of came to the table to propose ideas about accessibility and safety uh, and really trying to clear out the idea of cars, like people were fighting like crazy uh, about kind of doing anything here because this is such a sacred place. And so, you know, it took us seeing over and over, like, what do you mean? Like, this is like a driveway. People drive around this thing. Look how close the cars are to it. It doesn't even make sense. Like, why would you want that? And, you know, people just fear change, right? You know, they loved it for the way it was. Uh, and a part of me always, I would say, uh, empathized with that fear because, to be honest, we see in our cities all the time things of significance that are ruined by developers and people who don't really put the thought into it. And so, again, you know, they didn't know anything about us. Um, but I, I appreciated sort of the concern, but it really kind of got out of hand at some point where people were freaking out. There was actually protesting and pickets and things like this cartoon in the paper, all of which just added to the anxiety where like Jordan Rice and I, you know, it felt like fetal position at night, like under the desk sort of thing. Like, because if we screwed this up, that was going to be the end, right? Um, but we didn't. Uh, and, you know, that was because we had an amazing team of people who were probably also like, crapping themselves about it and you know we all wanted to nail this thing and so uh, we knew that we were doing the right thing uh, with respect to accessibility in terms of seniors people who aren't able to kind of traverse the rocks um, this was going to be a new experience that didn't take away from the old experience but it did remove cars um, and so it's been kind of a huge hit thankfully and the, the wood is weathering beautifully and kind of you see a lot of these tones of the natural rock in the area and what's great is there are actually aspects of it that keep being added on to in the last couple months where people want to like raise the bar of accessibility it's like well let's renovate this part of the washroom because we could have done better and so people have kind of gone all in on this idea now and so now you see people there like throughout the year not just in the summer and all through the night as well. So you can kind of see here, um, you know, it, it's like, this was like the one project we didn't have to pay a photographer. I mean, we did pay photographers, but like we didn't need to because it's just a place where everybody goes to take these incredible photos. And now we're, our work, uh, you know, the work that we did with our collaborators is part of that kind of image that you see. So 2021, we moved down kind of the street to a building, uh, also part of Pier 21 that, you know, I don't even know how we got in here. It's like the best view in the whole province, basically. We're just like hanging over the water out towards George's Island and just happened to be like a hundred feet from the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia site that uh, we're going to be working on. I think I might just have two projects. So I'll just go through this one quickly. It's, it was meant to be a way to consolidate both studio and uh, office. And this was before we moved into that office. So the order might be a little messed up here, but it was kind of dreamt of before COVID. And during COVID, it became very clear that A, I wouldn't want my staff in my house. And B, uh, I think it, we wouldn't have fit either because, you know, we were, I think, lucky enough that we grew a little bit during that COVID period um, with new projects and public projects that, you know, it kind of became uh, outdated before it started. 
so this is my own home and on the ground floor um, is a where I am right now is a community studio where people will be coming in from the neighborhood. We have a whole bunch of sort of pro bono uh, community projects that we're working on. Uh, I'll show an image of in a second. Uh, and so it's a place for people to meet and a place for us to talk within the community for the community. And, you know, I, I'm not uh, ashamed to say that at some point after 10 years, I started thinking to myself, I'm kind of tired of doing this for other people. Like I really need to do this for me. And so this was really an experiment on how to push things as far as I could. Um, and I'm really, really happy. It, it was also like a project where every single person in the office touched it because it was the least priority in terms of, you know, it's not billable. It's, it's like something that's hanging around, but everyone got a chance to work on it. But it was really kind of pushing that idea of materiality and texture and all those things I'm like personally interested in to a level that I was really proud of. And working with a lot of incredible friends and collaborators, people who I went to school with, like the handrails there and the brick light inset in the brick that was all done with my friends, Philo Timo in Toronto, who I went to U of T with, um, builders I had worked with on many other projects. Um, yeah, no, it was, and this room here, this is a bedroom looking into, uh, it's actually just looking into my son's bedroom uh, where his, where he has a little desk sitting at the window. Uh, and this is above the living room. And yeah, so this is downstairs where I am now. And so this is one of our projects we're working on in the community. It's uh, two minutes away. Uh, it's a century old home again that um, basically we're, we joined on to be the architects, designers, uh, and a way to try and help raise funds as well. And so this will be the home for 11 currently homeless uh, African Nova Scotian men. Uh, and so that's sort of mid construction right now. And hopefully that'll be done um, in the next couple months. And I'll just close off with uh, the art gallery. And so this is the site in the south end uh, near my office um, of the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. It was an international competition um, up against some pretty, pretty big names, but we sort of brought, brought the heat, as they say. But I would say that the first thing about this project was uh, going in with an extremely kind of honest strategy and putting together a team that wasn't really meant just to check boxes, but um, there was an honesty in the way that we made uh, indigeneity and kind of key members of the team sort of central to the process. Uh, and it really meant for all of us, for KPMB, for us, that we went down a road uh, that we hadn't traveled before. You know, there, again, there's the unknown. Uh, and trusting the process where uh, we ended up somewhere that we were all proud of, but, you know, took some courage to get there because we were listening to other voices that uh, don't have a strong voice in our profession. And so in that competition phase, meeting with elders in the community as a first point, not as a second or third point, but as point one to really kind of hear and listen to people looking at the site and immediately thinking that this was an opportunity to decolonize, rethink the way that we think about cities and the urban grid. Uh, and so that diagram on the right was really about uh, how we would traverse the site, how program could be laid out. It was about kind of just being, it was about rejecting these old ideas. And so looking to the eel, uh, as sort of the inspiration of the, both the form and the idea of sustainability in this project. Um, this was a beautiful sketch by Mark Ryan of Public Work uh, that really kind of pushed that idea a little bit further uh, in terms of a building that sort of meanders its way through the site and isn't square to the site the way that all the other projects are in the city. Beautiful sketches by Bruce that really start to lay out program and sort of make a, a sketch into architecture. 
in the sketch that really tried to kind of articulate and demonstrate the way that we were thinking about um, you know, old ways and new ways of thinking and, and where we would land in that. So this is the site plan. You can see how it sort of bends and contorts. Uh, you know, it's changed quite a bit since this time, which was over a year ago. Um, but uh, it was a pretty amazing journey to get here. And this is one of these images that, uh, you know, like those first ones of, you know, client and collaborators, it, it like brings a tear to my eye because it, uh, it's like, it didn't matter if you were like the administrator or finance, finance person in the office. It's like every hand was on deck for this competition. We had people working in four different provinces, uh, people just donating their time, people like going way overboard to build this model that was gonna be a part of our competition. So yeah, this was the final scheme here. Um, and, you know, we're hoping to break ground, I believe in the next month or two, you know, tender packages have gone out. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm very proud to say that a lot of things have changed on it uh, because, you know, when you're going in on a competition scheme, you're sort of looking at, uh, you know, you know, the list from the client, whatever, but you haven't really dealt at all with public consultation you know, there's a whole array of voices that haven't been heard at that point. There really is an opportunity to. And so I think that, you know, what we're really going to show in the end result is that, you know, this is not only pushing the boundaries of voices in architecture and who belongs, uh, but also uh, a new paradigm when it comes to, um, you know, who actually helps shape the buildings uh, that we inhabit in the city. And yeah, I always end with my team, um, people that were there before, people that are with us still, uh, you know, I've always been kind of opposed to the hand of God type sketching, you know, like master type thing. I, I've always thought that was ridiculous and it's, it's never true, uh, even in those situations where you hear it, you know, we are uh, a great group of people, everyone's voice is heard and, you know, best ideas win and uh, that's that's real like kind of studio vibe. So uh, just want to thank you guys um, for your attention. I appreciate being here and, and talking all. I wish I was there with you, but this is second. That was second to that. Well, thanks, Omar, for sharing your journey and your process and and your work with us today. And hearing you talk uh, throughout the whole um, uh, presentation, um, I was thinking like, we got to bring you over. We got to have your voice and your presence in the same space uh, and really resonate with us. Because I think to me, all your projects are about people and do, doing the right thing for the people and with the people sounds, sounds like, like it is the work that you're doing. And, and, and it sounds like that's where you're heading with the community project that you're, you're, you're working right now. So my question was actually, and we will invite some questions from the audience. Uh, maybe Tong, uh, you can talk about it, uh, to ask your question as well. Um, I, I, my question was where you had it now, it was my question, but I think it seems like you're already in that motion to address the community with your practice in a more, um, uh, with your own house as a kind of a, a gateway to that work. Is that, is that, is that fair to say, SS? Yeah, uh, you know, honestly, that was not the original plan. I mean, of course, community work was, but not necessarily uh, bringing, you know, meetings into the house in that way. But, you know, I think it was sort of a beautiful accident that ended up sort of, um, you know, morphing into that. I think what's more beautiful than bringing people into your home and, and being able to talk about how we can make our community better. I mean, it's, it's so much better than bringing them to the office. I mean, there's love there, right? So um, yeah, it's exciting. There's a couple of sub comments in the chat line here. Uh, Tong, do you want to ask a question? Is that? Uh... Yeah, um, sure. Um, can, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Uh, I, I just wondering, like, 
you, you started with your uh, residential products and to grow really uh, with your residential products. And uh, I wonder, have you ever had conflicts with the clients? Um, uh, sorry, could you say the first part again? I mean, have you ever had conflicts with your clients? Oh, conflicts. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, God, you know, like, I actually feel like, like I wouldn't say conflict, conflict, but it, it's like, I've gotten so much better. It's like every day I update the book of client rule book. Uh, and um, I've gotten a lot better at filtering, you know, I think that I'm not saying that people are either good people or bad people. It doesn't really matter. But I do think that there are people who you're going to work better with. And one of the things I say to people is, if you know what you want, this is not the way to go. Like if you already envision your cottage or whatever, it's, there are way cheaper routes you can take than working with us. If you want to go on a journey and sort of go through this process of the unknown with us, then I think it can be really fun, but it needs to be fun for the client because that's all I wanna do is have fun working on cool things for good people. And so in terms of conflict, yeah, it happens all the time. And um, sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. So the, the thing is you do really pick your clients. Well, I do, I do now. And, you know, even then I would say that, you know, there's no real way of knowing what's going to happen. Right. And so uh, sometimes the, the conflict comes from, you know, two people who want to do two different things. And I would say that at that point, you know, the role of the architect is to be convincing, you know, you convince with images or models or arguments, you know, like argument is like, like 80% of my job, it feels like. And it's like, how do you convince people to do things that are better for the project and for them or whatever? Um, but it's a learning process. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that uh, response, Omar. Uh, I think the last slide that you shared with us is a telling a slide that, you know, it's sort of kind of embedded in your whole presentation where you, when you show us uh, the people picture of the project. And I always talk, think about why architects don't show all the people involved in their work where the filmmakers do, right? So, yeah. and I think you, your sort of last slide really demonstrates your your sensibility and your way of uh, like approaching practice overall, I think, I think I really appreciated that slide because it is what you do and is how you do it, right? And then that's your nature of your practice. So thank you for sharing that. And today, all along, I think, you know, speaking the language of people, I think that's what uh, you talked about, a language of the land and language of the vernacular. And an adaptation sounds like perfect way of understanding your work. And, uh, and a, lot, a lot of learnings, I'm sure, in the audience today and the students as well. So thanks for uh, sharing your time with us today, Omar. Oh, I really you. hope that we can bring you over and, and, and then share the same space and the presence it will be amazing. I so we'll that. look for the next opportunity. Thank awesome. you very much. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jason. Okay. Cheers.